Hi guys, this is Davy G here. Welcome to part 2 of this in-depth look into the romance of the Three Kingdoms. In this video, we're going to pick up exactly where we left off, where Guan Yu left Cao Cao to go find his blood brother, Liu Bei. But before we get into that, one of the things that I've had to think about in making this video is whether I'd focus on the depiction of the story as described in the novel, or whether I'd focus on the objective historical fact as passed down by Chinese historians. But what I've realized, it's the depiction of the events that has been passed down for generations and generations and has moved people's souls. An objective historical analysis would say, well, this happened, then this happened, and this person took over this country, and this country went to war with that country, and this is what happened. But the story contains the human element, and it's this human element that despite hundreds and thousands of years passing, humans can still relate to the story. And the story, especially as it's depicted in the form of a novel, is in the end what people will remember. I have a feeling that the romance of the Three Kingdoms novel versus the actual history is probably what happened to the Bible. Events of importance happened, writers wrote down the important details, over time, the more surreal elements were dramatized until a man's mind had altered the original into a meta-level narrative that's supposed to be relatable to everyone and give life lessons. In the end, it's the altered version that has the greatest impact and gets remembered for generations. Now, I want to parlay this idea into the dynamic between Liu Bei and Cao Cao, the proverbial antagonist versus protagonist story. The objective history would state that neither of them is the good or bad guy, which is probably true. But what is it about the story of these two individuals that separates them? What they want is the same, after all. The Obey wants to reunite the kingdom. Is that also not what Cao Cao wants? And the difference between these two people's characters are emphasized in two things. First, their motivation and secondly, their methods. As depicted by the story, the motivation of Liu Bei is unselfish. He doesn't want to be the emperor, he wants to restore the emperor back to his throne and have the hand return to its former greatness. He wants to be a facilitator of that. He doesn't necessarily want to be the net beneficiary of this, whereas Cao Cao wants to conquer the land for himself. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that Cao Cao is evil and selfish. He believes that the Han days are over, and in the long time frame, he is correct about that. And on top of that, Cao Cao has a self-belief about his superiority to the other warlords as being the only one truly capable of not only reunifying the kingdom, but also being the only one capable of managing the affairs of the kingdom and bringing it back to prosperity. So by his eyes, he is also the good guy. But then we have to get down to the methods, and I want to put to you a new concept that is vital for distinguishing the motivations of these two characters. In terms of methods, Liu Bei is an idealist. It dictates his methods for how he's going to reunify the empire and bring the hand back to greatness. His idealism first constructs his unselfish goal, and then it creates the method for how he's going to get there. A good example that we mentioned in the previous video is when he goes to a Tao Qian, when Tao Qian is being invaded by Cao Cao, Tao Qian, so enamored by the propriety of Liu Bei, offers to give Shu province to Liu Bei, but Liu Bei refuses. Now in the end, Liu Bei gets the province, but Tao Qian has to offer it to him three times, and Liu Bei was adamant on refusing him, until Liu Tao Qian was on the verge of death. He believed that he was doing something right for the sake of being right, not because he had some kind of ulterior motive and wanted to get a reward for that, and he wanted to make it clear to everyone and make it clear to himself. This is a man who's determining the outcome of his reality based on his values, and he stands by them. Cao Cao, on the other hand, is a different animal. While well, Liu Bei is an idealist, Cao Cao is a pragmatist. One of the core fundamental ideas of Liu Bei's philosophy, in order to reunite the realm, you have to win back the hearts of the people and then heaven will be on your side. Now, Cao Cao doesn't necessarily believe in this hippy-dippy nonsense. To him, the world is in chaos. People would sell their own mothers out for two cents, people would betray each other constantly. In the realm that he's in, alliances are formed, 
people betray each other, people gang up on each other. It's the dog-eat-dog -dog world, and only the strongest will survive. As we mentioned in the previous video in the introduction, this is one of the bloodiest conflicts in Chinese history, ergo world history. When you're existing in this scarce time, in his world, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Not of these higher level ideals. You can worry about those high level ideals when peace is restored to the realm. Then you can take care of that stuff. But in the end, all these ideals, they're unrealistic when they're tried and tested by a scarce reality where people will devour each other. To illustrate this point, one of the first displays of Cao Cao's character comes in when he first fails in his attempt to assassinate Dong Zhuo, he's made into a fugitive. Dong Zhuo puts a bounty out on his head, and Cao Cao is forced to flee, going from county to county, trying to evade the henchmen of Dong Zhuo. It's in Zhongmu County where Cao Cao would be arrested as he was recognized by some of the guards there and he was brought to the county magistrate Chen Gong. Chen Gong would find a way to speak privately with Cao Cao and being so impressed with Cao Cao's seeming loyalty to the emperor for having tried to assassinate Dong Zhuo, Chen Gong promised not only to set Cao Cao free but join him as a fugitive and follow Cao Cao in his quest to reunify the empire. They escaped the village together and on their travels, they came across a house owned by one Lu Bo Shi, a sworn brother of Cao Cao's father. Going there to seek refuge, Lu Bo Shi, so happy of his new arrivals, said to them, I will go out and get some wine. As was common back in the day, they were raging alcoholics then. They used to drink a lot. So while Chen Gong and Cao Cao were resting in one of the cabins, they hear the sound of a sword sharpening. Now if you're a fugitive with a large bounty on your head, you don't take small signs like this lightly. Cao Cao puts his ear to the door and he hears the servant saying, Let's tie him up. Don't let him escape. And it's at this point, Cao Cao convinces Chen Gong that they're going to fight their way out. These servants of Lu Bo Shi are about to turn against them in order to take the bounty. 3, 2, 1, they grab their swords, they rush out of the door, and they kill everyone in the household. They kill all of Lu Bo Shi's family. It is only after this massacre that they discovered that instead of talking about them, they were talking about a pig that they were gonna eat for dinner. They see the pig tied up on the ground and they realize that they were murderers. Chen Gong was shocked by this. Cao Cao on the other hand took the initiative and decided that they would leave immediately. And on the road, they see Lu Bo Shi coming. They had just murdered his entire family and Cao Cao, without hesitation, pulls out his sword again rushes to Lu Bo Shi and kills the sworn brother of his father, lest he discover that Cao Cao and Chen Gong had murdered his whole family and eventually come to tell the authorities potentially, Cao Cao would rather sweep this under the rug and continue on with his journey. Chen Gong, being the voice of morality and reason, was disgusted. It's at these moments that Cao Cao would give one of the most famous quotes in the book. I would rather betray the world than have the world betray me. This, my friends, is the character of Cao Cao. Chen Gong and Cao Cao would stop to rest at an inn. Chen Gong tossing and turning about, about what crime they committed and what kind of person Cao Cao is, would look over and see Cao Cao sleeping like a baby. It's at this moment Chen Gong realizing, craftier and smarter than Dong Zhuo, Cao Cao posed a much bigger threat. And it's at this point Chen Gong leaves him. Another example, one of Cao Cao's pragmatic but rather unethical means to achieve success. During his campaign against Yuan Shu, his supply lines were overextended and his troops would become hungry. Cao Cao's goal was to ration his food for a certain amount of time. However, in rationing his food, he knew that his soldiers would become very disgruntled. So he hatched a plan in which he rationed the food well beyond what was necessary, giving the soldiers as little food as he could give them, essentially starving them. And at the point when the soldiers are so disgruntled and so starving, what he did, he summoned the supply deputy who was in charge of the rationing of the food. He promised the supply deputy that he was going to take care of his family and everything's going to be okay, but he needed to borrow his head which is unfortunately something that he couldn't return. He explained to the supply officer that he needed a scapegoat to appease the anger of the hungry man. So Cao Cao beheaded him and told everyone that the reason why they were going hungry was that the supply officer was intentionally starving them and it was his fault. So Cao Cao brought all the food that he had stored up over the days and gave them a grand feast 
and when all the food was essentially consumed, he told them, You now have three days to completely conquer Yuan Shu, and anyone who fails will be executed starting with myself. So in conclusion, what he did was he intentionally starved his troops, blamed someone else, increased the trust that the troops had for Cao Cao by killing the one that was responsible for their starvation, and improving the morale of the troops by convincing them that they had so much food, so much food that they were able to feast, but then covering up the fact that they actually didn't have any food by telling them that if they didn't conquer Yuan Shu in three days, that they'd all be executed. But the reality is they just didn't even have enough food for the next three days. But the troops having their trust re-established with Cao Cao, the morale much improved from thinking that they have enough food to last them. And with the morale boost, they defeated Yuan Shu, and this is how Cao Cao attained victory. From these examples, we can see the character of Cao Cao for what it is. A ruthless pragmatist who will stop at nothing to achieve his aims. And from the perspective of the protagonist of the story, the only way to quell the threat of such an evil genius is with virtuousness. So getting back to where we left off in the previous video, Liu Bei had suffered a terrible defeat. Guan Yu would fall into the hands of Cao Cao and he would escape. Guan Yu would find out that Liu Bei had taken refuge with Yuan Xiao and he's just escaped Cao Cao to go to him. Now some upright idealist this Liu Bei is, when he was defeated by Lu Bu, Cao Cao took him in. Liu Bei went to go seek refuge with Cao Cao. In the end he would sign a pact to assassinate him, escape with his army, and then retreat to Cao Cao's main rival Yuan Xiao. What kind of propriety is that. But let's just quickly take note of the fact that Cao Cao has essentially imprisoned the Emperor, and it's Liu Bei's sworn duty to free the Emperor and bring him back into prominence. Cao Cao is the primary obstacle for that, not to mention killing the Emperor's wife as punishment for giving out this blood-ridden edict that we talked about before. Liu Bei sees Cao Cao as his nemesis, as the Cao Cao who, who as we mentioned, highly regards Liu Bei and sees him as the greatest future threat. Regardless of that, Guan Yu would eventually find Zhang Fei, and they would eventually reunite with Liu Bei, who would go off on their own. But let's talk about the Battle of Guan Du. Now, Yuan Xiao had already missed his greatest opportunity to defeat Cao Cao. While Cao Cao was busy fighting with Liu Bei, one of his aide-de-camps, Tian Feng, had urged Yuan Xiao to attack Cao Cao while he was busy. However, Yuan Xiao had a sick son, and doting on his sick son, he decided he just didn't have the time to spare away from him and advised against this critical campaign. Furthermore, Yuan Xiao would even go as far as imprisoning Tian Feng under charges of demoralizing the army. Cao Cao was right in his evaluation of Yuan Xiao. Not only is he indecisive, but he also doesn't know how to take good advice. Skipping forward to the actual conflict between Yuan Xiao and Cao Cao, the most pivotal time during the conflict was called the Battle of Guan Du. It was near the Yan Ford on the Yellow River, being the divider that separates Yuan Xiao and Cao Cao's provinces. On top of that, Guan Du is on the road going towards Shucheng, the capital of Cao Cao's domain. It's here where Cao Cao would create many fortifications and earthen works in order to defend against an assault from Yuan Xiao's huge army. Yuan Xiao would respond by building huge towers where he would be able to send archers to rain down projectiles onto Cao Cao's fort. Cao Cao, however, responded by building mangonels, a kind of siege engine, to destroy these towers from afar. There'd be much fighting between Yuan Xiao's forces and Cao Cao's forces entrenched at Guandu. And Cao Cao's supplies would start to run low. Cao Cao discovered that Yuan Xiao had been storing supplies at a depot in the village of Gu Shi. Seeing the opportunity, he had a band of elite cavalry go and raid the supply store. Rather than taking the food back for his starving troops, Cao Cao instead decided to burn the supplies. In response to this, Yuan Xiao would send for many more supplies and had the supplies stationed at Wu Chao, a place around 40 kilometers away from Guandu. One of Yuan Xiao's advisors, Zhu Shou, argued that Wu Chao was being very poorly defended, but instead Yuan Xiao again ignored good advice. It's at this time an important advisor to Yuan Xiao, an advisor named Xu Yo, decided to defect Cao Cao. As Xu Yo's good advice, Advice had been ignored by Yuan Xiao many times. Xu Yu understood that Cao Cao was very low on supplies, but he told Cao Cao that Yuan Xiao was even more vulnerable as all of his supplies were being stored in Wu 
Sao and were being poorly defended, Sao Sao could easily go raid this place again and cause massive disruption to Yuan Shao's supply chain. Although some of the generals were very suspicious of Xu Yu, Sao Sao decided to take the advice. He personally led a cavalry force of 5,000, disguising his forces as reinforcements to defend Wu Chao. The town of Wu Chao was quickly overrun, and again, Sao Sao set all the supplies on fire. When Yuan Shao's camp heard that Wu Chao was under attack, he was urged by his generals to go and send reinforcements before it's too late and all the supplies are lost. However, Yuan Shao did the opposite. Seeing that Cao Cao was still at Wu Chao, Yuan Shao decided to lead his hordes in an all-out assault against Guan Du. Cao Cao ignored pleas to split his forces and continued the assault on Wu Chao. While luckily, Yuan Shao's forces were not able to penetrate the walls of Guan Du. After suffering many heavy losses, not only were Yuan Shao's forces completely demoralized from the loss of their food and the many losses they suffered at the failed attempt to take over Guan Du, two of Yuan Shao's leading generals went over to Cao Cao and defected. And if that wasn't bad enough, Cao Cao cut off the noses of many of the fallen soldiers at Wu Chao, mixed them with noses and lips of oxen and horses, and spread them around Yuan Shao's camp in order to intimidate them. And whilst this might seem like overkill for someone who is very certain to win the battle and has everything going on his side, you have to remember Yuan Shao's forces are up to a million and Cao Cao's still only 200,000. So Cao Cao's doing everything that he can to guarantee that he's going to win the war. It's at this point of peak demoralization, Cao Cao orders an all-out assault on Yuan Shao's forces, by which time Yuan Shao's forces completely rout and the Battle of Guandu is won for Cao Cao. Shortly after, Yuan Shao would die due to illness, possibly caused by all the stress of all this, and after this, Cao Cao would go to war with with Yuan Shao's sons, who had inherited the province. The brothers would be disunified and fought each other over the inheritance of their father, leaving them easy pickings for Cao Cao's experienced war machine. It's at this point, out of the ashes of Yuan Shao's defeat, Cao Cao would clearly be the hegemon of northern China, and the foundations of the Northern Wei Dynasty were built. So during this whole time, our hero protagonist and his friends are essentially wandering the lands and are homeless. And whilst they still have some soldiers with them, some quote unquote borrowed from Yuan Shao, they had also encountered a group of yellow turban, the leader of which was a huge fan of Guan Yu and begged to join the band of heroes. So they certainly weren't alone on their journey, but they had no place to call home and they desperately needed to seek refuge somewhere. So it's at this time, Liu Bei calls on his long-lost imperial relative Liu Biao to the south. Liu Biao was the governor of an important province called Jing, and it's here where Liu Bei and company would go to seek refuge. Liu Bei offered to give his military services in defending Jing province from Cao Cao. However, unbeknownst to Liu Bei, there's a lot of political intrigue going on in Jing province at this time. One, Lady Sai, the wife of Liu Biao, was part of the Cao clan, not to be confused with Cao Cao's Cao clan, but the Cao clan of of Jing province. Many of the officials, and most importantly the military, were members of the Cao clan, and the general of the Jing army was one Cao Mao, the brother of Lady Sai. These two would conspire together to achieve hegemony in the Jing province. Now the successor to Liu Biao was one Liu Qi, as he was the eldest son, but he had a half-brother named Liu Song, which was born to him by Lady Sai, Liu Qi and Liu Song are half brothers. Lady Sai wanted the successor to be of Cao blood and arranged for the marriage of Liu Song to her niece. And Lady Sai would convince her husband to select Liu Song as the successor. However, this whole plan was threatened when Liu Bei came to Liu Bao. Liu Bei and Liu Bao. Although they had never met before, they share imperial blood. And when Liu Bei lived with Liu Biao, they became very closely acquainted with each other. Liu Biao told of the dilemma that he currently faces, which one he should favor, Liu Qi or Liu Tong. Although Liu Bei not wanting to originally get involved, Liu Bei told of the tragedy that would occur if the ancient rites of succession weren't duly adhered to, and he explained what happened to Yuan Shao. In the end, his sons ended up fighting over each other precisely because Yuan Shao had gone over the elder in favor of the younger when it came to the succession. Lady Sai discovering this plotted to have Liu Bei killed as he was disrupting the entire conspiracy. So she asked of her brother Cai Mao to go and do something about him. Liu Bei would be lucky to escape with his life when Cao Mao's men suddenly came into his house looking for him. Liu Biao hearing of this, angrily reprimanded Cao Mao, but Liu Biao being very fearful and anxious between his own clan and the Cai clan, decided not to do anything about Cao Mao, feeling his hands completely tied. Cao Mao would make another attempt on Liu Bei's life, 
At a gathering for local officials in which Liu Bei was made to attend, Liu Bei would again escape with his life, but this time being forced into the wilderness alone. He stumbled across a small farm, and Liu Bei, going to seek aid, met a man named Sima Hui, his small house being lined with books and scrolls. Sima Hui was the kind of man who simply wanted to be far away from the volatility of the time and immerse himself in study. Liu Bei and Sima Hui would talk for a long time. Liu Bei related his feelings of well, depression, essentially. At his failure, after many years, having no success to speak of, he'd been defeated again and again, and he's wandered homeless, seeking refuge with others. Sima Hui would say, despite the fact that he has valiant warriors such as Zhang Fei, Guan Yu, and Zhao Zilong, someone we haven't mentioned, also a very highly prized and valiant warrior, Liu Bei had a big dream. But he had no advisor, he had no learned intellectuals around him to give him good advice. It's at this point Sima Hui would tell Liu Bei of two individuals, one of which especially will change his destiny forever. Sima Hui would mention two names, Crouching Dragon and Young Phoenix. He said if you have either one of these two people on your team, you will have the strength to reunite the nation. Liu Bei thought long and deeply about this. It's true, valiant warriors they had, check. A big dream, check. But strategy was nowhere to be found. And here Liu Bei meets Sima Hui. Sima Hui came across as a highly gifted hermit. He seemed to know everything. And after many hours of talk, it was clear that Sima Hui was a highly intelligent individual. Yet when he spoke of this sleeping dragon, it was almost as if Sima Hui considered himself a dunce beneath the sleeping dragon. How is it that there could be such a genius of renown living in the land? On top of that, he wasn't serving any lord. Like Sima Hui, this mysterious sleeping dragon was also a hermit, rebuffing the requests of powerful warlords. The sleeping dragon would be happy to be away from it all, not serving anybody. But Liu Bei knew he had to acquire the service of this man. He had a feeling. Although the legend of this mysterious individual had only been named in rumor, Liu Bei would set his heart on finding this mysterious sleeping dragon. It's at this juncture of the road, Liu Bei has no choice. For him, the years have gone by like seconds. He spent years and years and years fighting enemies, being on the run, being a fugitive, being homeless, getting no closer to the success of his goal than he was at the beginning of his journey. He's had a very hard journey, he even contemplated suicide a few times. It's at this point in his life, he needs to take a leap of faith, and meet a man that may potentially change his life and redirect the course of fate. Liu Bei would return to Xinye province where he was stationed. And when he heard word of where this sleeping dragon generally was, he set out with Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. And he made sure to stress that this journey to find this mysterious sage would be treated like a pilgrimage. Guan Yu and Zhang Fei weren't amused though. One of the failing characteristics of Zhang Fei and Guan Yu is that, being so mightily strong, they had no respect for anybody else. All they see is power through battle, and as far as they knew, no one was as strong as them. How could it be that this sleeping dragon has all this undeserved acclaim? After all, all he's done during this time of chaos is hid away in the mountains. He hasn't served anyone, and he has no accomplishments to his name. But he has the gall to compare himself to intellectual greats of previous times, Guan Zhong and Yue Yi. How can he make such a statement? However, Liu Bei would angrily reprimand them. Liu Bei was already sold. On their journey, they would encounter many individuals who would speak of the fame of this sleeping dragon. Liu Bei, not knowing his appearance or even his name, would bow low and hard each time he met an interesting looking individual on the way, thinking this random person may be the sleeping dragon. After finally meeting a supposed friend of sleeping dragon, during a brief chat over tea, this friend said this sleeping dragon is not in today, and they would have to come back another time. But mind you, this pilgrimage has taken a full day, they'd be led all the way up the mountains. It wasn't just the most convenient thing to go back on your way and come back another time. They had no phones back then. So defeated and a bit humiliated, they decided to return back to Xinye and wait for a more lucky time. Now, I just want to point out that even though Liu Bei grew up in poverty and was known as a weaver of mats, back in Xuchang, when Liu Bei was under the refuge of Cao Cao, he had met the emperor. And as I mentioned before, the emperor had a lot of hope in Liu Bei. First, the hereditary records were checked, and they did confirm that Liu Bei was in fact an imperial scion, 
and technically qualified as a great uncle to the emperor. Now, of course, it's a great, great, great uncle, but still, to be known as the uncle of the emperor is a grand title. And from that time onward, his title would be known as the imperial uncle. So despite still being in poverty, not necessarily having any land of his own, Liu Bei was still considered part of the gentry. And it's considered well beneath his rank to go visit some hermit in the mountains and not be received by him. But such was the respect of this sleeping dragon that Liu Bei didn't even think twice about treating this individual with high honours. So after a long while, they decided to go again. This time, it was snowing. Again, Zhang Fei and Guan Yu were not happy about this. Their lord, a scion of the imperial house, the imperial uncle, lowering himself to go through the snow, up the mountains, to beg for the service of a man with undeserved reputation. Again, Liu Bei had to scold them for this, and off they went. And again, Liu Bei bowing nice and for all those interesting individuals that would meet along the way, falsely assuming that they might be the sleeping dragon, was met with more embarrassment from Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. He would finally make it to Sleeping Dragon Ridge, supposedly the place where this sleeping dragon rested. Knocking on the door, a young man would open. Dear sir, I've been waiting a long time to meet you, said Liu Bei. But the man wasn't Sleeping Dragon. He introduced himself as his brother, and explained that his brother was on a trip, wandering here and there, and he didn't know when he was going to come back. And again, Liu Bei, feeling great defeat from this failed enterprise, requested the brother for some ink and paper so he could leave a note. Then the young brother exclaimed, Master is here! To which Liu Bei ran outside, and saw an old man walking along the bridge towards them. Liu Bei rushed out excitedly. Oh sleeping dragon sir, I've been waiting a long time for you. Unfortunately, this also wasn't him. It was sleeping dragon's father-in-law. The overexcitement was replaced with despair, and the brothers went back to Shinya. It seems they're being intentionally rebuffed, or tested, but either way, the sleeping dragon didn't want to meet the heroes. But such was the resolve of Liu Bei. He didn't want to quit at all. This time, Liu Bei decided to prepare even more. Liu Bei would check the stars for alignments, and find an auspicious day to return to Sleeping Dragon Ridge. When came the auspicious day, he again came with Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. They came up the same mountain, except this time he dismounted many miles beforehand and decided to walk on foot instead. Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, visibly displeased by this, Liu Bei said he wanted to express his deep sincerity for meeting this sage. And again, Zhang Fei and Guan Yu were not happy about this. But when they finally arrived, he was there. The sleeping dragon was finally at home. Knock knock. The brother opened up and he said, yes, the master is back home from travels. But right now he's having a nap. Liu Bei, not wanting to disturb this master, decided to wait. This sleeping dragon fellow was sleeping with his back facing outwards on the couch. Liu Bei decided that he would kneel there until he wakes up. But Liu Bei would kneel and kneel and kneel until four hours had passed. But Zhang Fei, being a poor-tempered alcoholic, couldn't stand to see his lord humiliated like this. Who was this sleeping dragon who humiliates our lord? Zhang Fei had it. He decided he was going to wake up the sleeping dragon by setting his house on fire. Note to the listener, if you're going to make a sacred oath of fraternity, don't do it with a violent alcoholic. With the house burning and the smoke rising, the sleeping dragon finally awakens. Guys, if you like this video, make sure to leave a like. And if you want to see part 3, give me some encouragement and go ahead and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.